Uh, shalom to everybody, to especially our family and friends. Uh, welcome to Torah Talks with Tony and Bill. I'm Tony. This is Bill. I call him Papa B. Uh, we have been in a discussion here in our Shabbat service that's been really inspirational. Um, people have been really vulnerable and transparent and sharing beautiful stories. We've heard a lot of good things um, that, that was talked about here. And all of it is so key to where we are right now. We, um, this particular Parsha, uh, Vaishalek, is important to me because it's, it's prototypical of our journey home, so to speak. And I'll let you explain what we mean by our journey home and give a little overview of the Parsha. But I really want to focus on the journey back home and, and how important it is for us to understand how we got here, right? We, in our, in our Shabbat service a little bit ago, we were talking about uh, our character of the day, if you would, our character of the Parsha, which is Yaakov, and, and his experience and his journey home. One of the things that we spent some time on is um, his wrestling. Uh, I like the way Troy talked about that, his wrestling, and we, we'll, we'll talk about that more, but it wasn't just the wrestling with um, the angel, the angel of Esau, if you would. It wasn't just about the wrestling with the angel. That was very important. But there was also 20 years, right, that we we didn't get a chance to really explore deeply, but there was 20 years. I think Jose talked about Levon, and, and we need to just put that together because it wasn't just 20 years and it wasn't just the wrestling. It, there was some slime that needed to be removed from yes. Yaakov's life because of where he was going. His destiny was calling him. God was sending him home to embrace his destiny. But a part of the, the response to destiny uh, was he had to hear the Lord's voice. And one of the things that we talked about here in the Parsha and one of the things that I believe Troy brought up was uh, the Tahor moment, right? We, we, he didn't get there on his own, right? There had to be these 20 years, as long as that may feel, as, mo, as long as it may have felt to, felt to him, it was necessary. The Bible says God works all things out to the good of those who he loves and are to call according to his purpose. So this is really important. This 20 years plus the encounter was all necessary to get him here. You mentioned when you when you set this up, and then I then I want to turn this over to you to talk a little bit about our Parsha and about you know his 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 going home. You you lined this up this way two weeks ago in Tolda. You talked about that being the antithesis initiative, right? And I'm saying this because all this was important to even get to this point. And this is where you talked about, this was the introduction of iron sharpening iron um, interactions, one-on-one personal archetype training. So it started here with having to deal with opposition, having to deal with the challenges of someone on the other side of you thinking differently than you are and, have, and opposing your views and all of that. And then we moved to uh, last week, uh, Vayise, where we talked about the uh, exile disciplines, right? Because he's, he's in exile now. He's driven away from his home. Mother in, <laughs> encouraged him to do so. This is going to introduce immersion therapy is what you called it. This is how we learn to stay focused on the calling, the mission, and the assignment. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. Ah. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. Those words are very challenging to the human spirit because of everything we're challenged by and everything that's happening in our current world. And it's easy to get caught into that and begin to take on the slime of that and try to function in that slime, not realizing that the slime is actually influencing the way we think and view these things. And then we come down to this week. Uh, and you call this the return protocols lessons in <laughs> grab your seat better everybody lessons in humility and teshuva humility and teshuva your closed long journey of teshuva 
Talk to us about this Parsha and how important it is for us to answer the call to return home. The Torah is, is, is a broad-ranging book of wisdom, and it's our story. It tells the story uh, that, that the patriarchs walked before us, that paved the pathway, paved the, the journey uh, route that we're going to follow. So as we're in the, the section of the Torah that we know of as the Patriarchal Chronicles or the stories of Abraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov and eventually Yosef, as we're in this section of the Torah, we say, where are the commandments? Where are the, the, the specific instructions? Could just tell us what to do. And before he even starts with the first instruction of what to do, what practical applications to make to live a well-lived life, he needs to tell us what our he wants to tell us what our story really is, mm. who we really are, why we are really here, who we really belong to, and whose uh, servants we're really supposed to be. Mm. So that's what this whole narrative of Abraham first, and then Yitzhak, and now into Yaakov, and eventually we'll go into Yosef as well. It'll go into the greater nation of Israel in the book of Exodus. Mm -hmm. It'll go into the idea of you mentioned Tahor, the the purity. The idea of, of maintaining purity from the slime, the world around us is full of it. It will slime us. It will cause us to be angry. It will cause us to be wounded and hurt, offended, victimized, entitled, all sorts of things that the world will throw at us. That's the slime the world slings at us. Yes. But we have to make a choice, and that's where the book of Leviticus is going to come in, the book of Vaikra, about choosing not to let the slime in and not to let it take over our lives, but instead to maintain this energy of purity, Kedusha, that's what the book of, and then we get into the book of Numbers, and we have to deal with this on a day-by-day -day basis, facing all sorts of trials, discomforts, challenges as a nation, as a people, and then, of course, we get into the final preparations for entering into the, the fullness of who we are. Hmm. Now, that's, the, the whole story of Torah is a story of being, uh, coming to an awakening, of who we are, mm -hmm. of why we are here, and why we are not allowed to be like other people. Why we were not to just get caught up in our emotions, mm -hmm. get caught up in our offenses, get caught up in outrage, get caught up in, in feelings of victimization or entitlement. Sure. Why that is not going to be productive for our calling. Mm -hmm. And how we have to learn to be able to stay at peace within ourselves keep a three-foot window around this hours that, that has shalom, peace, joy, hope, gratitude, humility, all emanating from this three-foot window and there that we touch, everything we touch is touched by that, that shalom, by that joy, by that gratitude, by that humility, by that grace that's mm -hmm. within us. So that is the, the whole overview of Torah. Now we're into some specific Hard lessons. Mm. We're learning about Yaakov, Jacob, as the rest of the world tends to know him. Uh, and so we're learning about his journey from being in captivity, uh, in exile, and getting slimed every single day by every single way, in every single direction <laughs> coming at him, largely from Levon, but from the entire culture of the yes. East. He's getting slimed with this stuff, and he, he has to keep his business going has to keep doing what he does because he can't go home yet. Finally, he receives the word, a, a visitation, uh, a light shines from heaven. It, it, may, it may not look like that for us. We may not get a, a voice speaking out of the night. Sure. We may not get a, a divine shaft of light, but somehow deep within our souls, each one of us, I believe, in this room, believe it probably watching this video today, mm -hmm has had some sort of an awakening experience. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're listening today. That's why you're here. That's why we're having this conversation. It's because we want to know what to do with this awakening. Yes. How, to, how to walk it out. How to, keep, how to maximize it. How not to, to just blow it off. Not, not to just, just say, well, that was a great experience. Mm -hmm. Not to look at it from a standpoint of religion. Not to look at it from a standpoint of some sort of a, of a sacramentation that we're sacramentology we're going to do, right. but instead to build upon it to make the foundation of a life that has a meaningful impact in the world. Hmm. Now that being the case, we've got to look at Yaakov's life story, and in this parsha, 
There are basically ten stations he has processed through on his way home. He's had the awakening, and the awakening had a call with it. Return. Return to your father's house. Return to where you came from. Actually, the Hebrew word on the next phrase is return to the birth person you are. To your birth. To your birthing. Be born again, we would might say it in some theological sense. Go back to reality of who you really are. And this call, this is the wind in the sails, as it were. Our lives are the sails. We lift the life up, and the wind hits those. And that's what Yaakov is operating under. He's going to go home, return home, become who you are, return to who you really were, shake off the slime, go through the processing, and whenever you get through with this, you will be having a positive impact upon your world. That's the lesson of the entire Parsha. But the, the process is not always pretty. So we're going to go through some of the most feared, uh, challenging situations, uh, these stations that he's going to be processed through to, to shake off the slime. They're going to have some serious uh, angst to them. Right. He's going to face his brother Esau, his enemy, as he sees him now, mm -hmm. Esau. He's going to face the fear that he will actually be killed, as Esau said he was going to do when he saw him the next time. Right. Uh, and then he has to face through that process. He will. He will. God will have a, the Holy One will have a plan and a strategy to process Yaakov through that fear. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be a tense moment, a tense night, a whole <laughs> night, and then a experience the next morning. Then he's going to go through so many more. Shechem. Mm -hmm. He's going to face. The tragedy of a of a, of a uh, atrocity yes. done against his own flesh and blood, his daughter Dina. He's going to face the the rising up of the worst side, the most violent side of at least two Shimon and Levi of his own sons, and how even that is participated in by the rest of the sons. And there's mm -hmm. this negative influence on his own household mm -hmm. that turns into a violence. That was not in, in harmony with the, with the idea of, of reconciliation and restoration and fixing the world, the plan. So he has to deal with the offset of that. He's going to lose his, uh, his, his beautiful, beloved wife, Raquel, in childbirth. And he's going to have to process through the pain and the agony of that. How do you deal with that? And how do you maintain your equilibrium? What do you turn loose of at each of the stations? What does the Holy One shake off of you? What aspects of slime have become identity mm -hmm. issues? This is who I am. I am the slime. I am the I am the victimization. Right. I am the victim. I am the the the, the wounded one. I am the the, the entitled one. Mm -hmm. I, what? How do we shake those things off and get to humility, mm -hmm. and get to gratitude, and get to meaningful activity interaction with life? That's the processing we're going through. These are stories we're being told because so, these stories have paved the way for our own experience in life. You talked about uh, meaningful impact on the world, right? And we, you and I are building this whole narrative around um, becoming the, you know, um, the strategic the, counterbalance, the service, service model, model, the service model, the strategic counterbalance is, is this is the initiative. But the counterbalance to the Ra, the Shakad and Hamas, that's who we are. We're becoming that we are that counterbalance. Yaakov is going home to realign with with who he is supposed to be. And that realignment, um, you called it a season, you call this a season of gradually coming into. I like that you use that word gradually because you don't wake up one morning and all of a sudden you're, you're there, right? It takes time. Um, we talked about how the revelation of downloads are doses. They're, they're dosed to us. We don't get it all in one night. So this is a process for us. We're, we're, we're trying to align. Coming home is, is aligning with the divine plan for our families, um, for our nations, for our geographical places in, in the world. But we're called to be that. That's, that's a part of our calling. When, when I think about the, the slime effect, the slime impact, um, Yaakov brought some slime with him. He didn't just pick it up all at Levan's house. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> he brought some stuff with him out of his experience, out of out of his life. And so these 20 years and the encounters and everything that God's going to do is addressing that as well. I, I wanted to talk about this also. We're going to see Esau, and, and it looks like everything's well after his encounter. Like he's good to go, right? Everything is over. He's He's... he's into his identity now he loves Jacob and and 
and it's over, right? But we know just because of what's going on currently that no, it didn't end there, right? Um, there's still some things that was carried over into the next generation, into the next generation. The decisions that we make, the energy that we carry into our decision-making process, it it is transgenerational, right? It will affect our children. It will affect our grandchildren. So we want to be wise about answering the call to realign. But here's something that you talked about. The first thing that's required for this realignment is detoxification, right? I don't know who's willing to admit it, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. There are ways in which I assimilated into the culture and took on some of the cultural things that goes on in our world. I've taken on some of those things. I've ingested some of the influences. I've taken on some of the ways of thinking, thought process, patterns of, of dealing with decision making, blah, blah, blah. And because I've done that, Sometimes it's difficult for me to make a kingdom of heaven sent to society decision in this moment, right? Because I'm impacted by my assimilation into the culture. So when you say the first thing required is detoxification, what does that look like in real time? Well, in real time, detoxification looks often a lot like it does in the, in the world of drugs and chemical addictions. There's withdrawal pains. <laughs> There's a sense of depri deprivation. So the first thing that comes with detoxification is c disconnecting from the source of the slime. Mm. Now that means that you have to get a higher perch or a higher perspective where you're not listening to the same voices telling you the same stories again, the same negative narratives, the same hate-filled, uh, hurtful, uh, repeating. And sometimes those voices are your own voices. You have to displace the voices within you. Right. And sometimes it's, it's actually painful not to let yourself think the thoughts that you were thinking because of your cultural indoctrination mm -hmm. or your own victimization that you experienced because of your own life, your own personal experiences. The, the process of detoxification, first of all, is cutting yourself off, getting a higher perspective, mm -hmm. and then walking through the, the trauma and understanding that the, the, the DTs, or the, <laughs> the, yeah. the, uh, the, the tremors, mm -hmm. that we're experiencing the virtue of the withdrawal from the things we're commonly used to, accustomed to, addicted to, are actually designed to help us be free. Mm -hmm. We have to process through those, uh, those different delirium tremor, tremors, the different uh, <laughs> uh, things that grip us and, and cause the problem. Mm -hmm. And as we do so, we, what we find is this amazing thing. The detoxification is based upon something very important. The Holy One called us to this detoxification. Mm -hmm. And what He calls us to, He will empower. Yes. And He will give us the strength to do so. So what, in the detoxification, not only are we disconnecting from the sources, from the material, from the things, or, or not only are we quieting those voices from within ourselves, mm -hmm. we're connecting to the source of all energy and power in verse. We're getting closer and closer, drawing closer and closer into the eternal light, the in infinite light of mm -hmm. His presence and the beauty of His personality. I work in the field where we detox people. Right. right? And that's why I'm really, I'm, when, you, when you use this word, it meant a lot to me because I, I see it, right? And we have a thing that happens within the second or third day of the detox, uh, the way the person began to, to act and behave. Um, it almost looks like psychosis, you know, when the person starts to describe what they're going through. And if they weren't in a hospital environment, right? that detoxification would be detrimental to their lives. We have to do things in the process yeah. to keep them uh, not just functioning, but keep them alive sometimes based on what they're coming off of. And then there is a point to where if they weren't in the hospital, they would return to the source for just a little bit of comfort, for just a moment, right, of, of relief. But what that does is put them back into the addiction, right? It, it, it reintroduces them to the addiction, and it's even more powerful. It's like the seven times worse. It's even more powerful and more deadly when they return to it uh, after such a time of detox. 
when I think about the things that God has called me away from and out of, there are times where I start a proverbial trembling or shaking. I feel like I need to go back to those things, right? Mainly because I've developed an identity in it, mm -hmm. right? And so the call to destiny, the call to my true identity, and that's where I want to, I'm kind of leading you there because I want you to talk about it. the call to my destiny, the call to my true identity is very, very important to everything in my life, right? Your Cole's calling was important, not just to everything in his life, but even in our lives today who he has no idea who we are, right? Or that we would exist. But the decisions he, were, he was making at that point, the experience he was going through, the challenges and all the things, but at the end, ultimately, his life, his destiny was important for all of us that exist right now. And because of this story, we can even understand, or at least a little bit, where the energies are coming from that we're dealing with right now with from the Ra, the, the, Hamas, the uh, Shekinah and Hamas, we can actually see, we understand based on the Torah where that energy is coming from. When you, when you talked about detoxification, what you mentioned here is the shaking off of exile slime, right? And here's some things that you talked about, disentangling from victim entitlement mentality. We, look, we, in our culture, we're being taught to embrace this stuff, right? Um, letting go of self-obsession and emotional, hormonal reaction and starting to think covenantly and cross-generationally. Man, it's hard to think that way in the midst of, you know, in the moment, right? It's hard to think beyond the moment when I'm in pain right now. That's why, you know, when we're detoxing somebody, we have to constantly remind them of why it's important to stay in this process and let us help you through this process. I feel like the 20 years was like a detox period, right? Like he needed to be in that moment. I know it was horrible and stuff. He felt, you know, he's being used and, you know, he's, all this stuff is happening to him. But those things were used by, by the Father to help reestablish him as a model, a service model in the earth that was going to counter what was coming from the raging nations, right? Even at this time, the raging of his brother, right? And everything he would see beyond this point, everything his sons would deal with, and, and especially yourself. When we talk about gradually coming into alignment with our identity, what is that identity? Yeah. We are, obviously, the beginning part of it is, it starts with these, I call it the ten words that lead up to the ten words. The ten words, or the ten commandments, as people call them in the Western language, actually come from Exodus chapter 19. We're nowhere close to Exodus 19 yet. We're still in the book of Genesis. So there's ten words of the Holy One, the Creator, that guide us and tell us what our identity is before the ten words, which tell us how to put that identity to work. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the way you, that, that it works. So with the ten words before the ten words, what are they? The first one is, the Holy One looked at His creation. He saw the earth, which we are made of the earth. He said... It's tohu vavohu. It's without form. It's void. It's meaningless. It has no substance to it, no purpose to it. And so he spoke into it these words in Hebrew, yehi or, or. Yeah. be, light, be, become, emit. And so the first word of the ten words, the first identity factor of us is we are of the light. Mm. We are of that. That is who we are. That is our identity. We're not of the darkness. We're not of the confusion. We're not of the purposelessness or meaninglessness or vanity of life. Mm -hmm. We're of the light. So that's number one of the ten statements. Now, we, I won't go through all ten because sure, we'd be sure. here all day to do so. But you mm -hmm. know where they are, basically. I believe you do because whenever it says, and, and then later in chapter one of Genesis, he says, let us create man. Mm -hmm. Let us make man. What, who are we? What is our identity? He tells you who your identity is, states too, beyond being the light right. to the world, to the creation, to the species, to the entire environment, the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Beyond being that, you are to be Betselem Elohim. You are to be mm -hmm. the imagery. You are to be the shadow. When he moves, you are to move. Mm 
We are to be responsive on the earth to his movements in the heavens. Hmm. We are to be the shadow of the Holy One upon the earth. And we are to present to the world his likeness. Now, this yeah. is your identity. Yeah. We're supposed to carry the image and the likeness of the Holy One in our behaviors, in our facial expressions, mm -hmm. in our responses to trials and tribulations, in our, our conversations that we have, in our behavior patterns, in our responses to trials, as we said. All these things are supposed to, and that we're supposed to show the world, the other species, the other people of the earth, the nations, right. what it looks like to handle things the way God would handle them or the way he would want it handled. Mm -hmm. That's just the first two of the ten words. We could go much further into Genesis and then into Exodus and Leviticus. And I'm not going to go there. You can find your own, the ten words before the ten words. Right. But those are two of the beginnings and very critical to the factor. Now, if you know what your identity is, and when he says return, go back to that identity. Go mm -hmm. back to who you birthed, mm -hmm. who I birthed you to be. You're going to go back to being children of the light. Yeah. And that means you're going to have to detox from the darkness. You're going to be children of the image and the shadow of the Holy One. That means not walking in the shadow of men, not walking in the shadow of politics, mm -hmm. not walking in the shadow of ideology, not walking in the shadow of some government or form of government, mm -hmm. not walking in the shadow of some ethnicity or religion or some form of structure of this or that, nothing of man. You are instead reflecting the image of the Holy One. Now, you see, this mm -hmm. is where the identity and the detox come in together. Yeah. And it goes on further from that, which would take hours to discuss if we did. Wow. So we're, we're going to close here. But I want to issue a word of encouragement for those that are answering the call to return home to your destiny, to your true identity in, in the creative universe. You're not alone. Uh, he let your cove know. I want you to go home, but you're not alone. I want you to return your destiny, you're not alone. Three weeks ago, I was having one of the most difficult times in my life on my job, trying to work through the stuff that was happening on my job and the way I was perceiving it. I told you guys before, from a book I've read, drama lives in the story we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's what the pain is. Yeah. It's what we tell ourselves. And I was telling myself stories about what I was experiencing. And it was, it was very challenging. I talked to my wife about quitting my job and so on and so forth. And somehow, I not only survived that period, but I overcame it and then I transcended that moment. And I learned from it and I grew through it and I'm in a better place today. I'm still working the job. I'm still interacting with the children. I'm still trying to be a blessing to those patients and the staff that's been placed in my care. And I get here today and the Holy One found out that three weeks ago, the Holy One put it on a man's heart to start praying for me. You, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> nope. Three weeks ago, I start going through a very difficult time in my life where I'm thinking about quitting my job. I'm thinking about doing something different. I tell my wife, I, don't, I, I can't do this anymore. And my wife is encouraging me. We go on and so forth. But and then, but the same time I'm going through that, God's put it on somebody's heart to start praying for me. So he comes today, and in the hallway he says, "I don't know what was going on, but three weeks ago the Lord put you on my heart." <laughs> right. And he starts telling me what the Lord was telling me, what the Lord was bringing forth, revealing in my life about why I was there and even in the, even in my, my situation where I live and, and not just a job but the bigger picture type things. You are not alone. You are on his mind. And he will neither leave you nor forsake you. 
and your destiny is calling and he's doing everything, he's using everything in your world right now to help you be equipped to answer the call of destiny. What we pray over you right now, those of you that are listening, is that you would embrace your God-given identity and that you won't respond to anything else. I'll close on this. I was doing a group, Papa B, with the children. I had my girls were acting out so I had to do a group with them and I said I'm going to pay you I'm going to incentivize you not to answer this is a game if you don't answer to anything I call you other than your name I'm going to pay you so I had each girl turn and face the wall and I stood in the middle of the room and I said until I call your name don't turn around if I don't call your name and you answer to something that's not you, you're disqualified from the gift. And the gift was just some chips and a, a blast from Sonic. Yeah. So I start calling out names. Peter, Paul, Benjamin. These are all women. <laughs> Ted, John. No girl turned around. The reason we was having the group is because the girls were calling each other names. Uh -huh. And they were getting into fights because of what they heard somebody say. So then I started calling out some ugly names. Mm. No girl turned around. Yeah, good. And then I started calling their real names one by one and they all flipped around one by one. I said, wow. So really, you guys have the power to ignore anything other than your real names. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I only want to answer. And I said, I want you guys to covenant with me. I only want to answer to what God calls me. But to do that, he has to train me, and sometimes in training, he has to incentivize. Look, Jacob had an incentive. He, he read it back to God when he prayed. He had an incentive not to respond to anything other than his identity, than his destiny. We're getting to the place where it's going to be very important that you don't respond to slime. You respond to your identity. All right, God bless you. We are out. We'll see you next time on Torah Talks with Tony and Bill again. I'm Tony. That's Bill. I call him Papa B. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.